Ed has kindly travelled down today to Derbyshire because he's going to do a video on our Citroen 2 CV and we thought it'd be a good opportunity for me to do a video on his Rover Metro 1.1C. <laughs> So the first thing to notice when you step into the Rover Metro, particularly those that have owned the previous generation Austin Metro, is there is quite a lot unchanged really, to be honest. Austin Rover, as Austin Rover always was, was always short of cash. And so although they were very successful in making the Rover Metro look suitably different to its predecessor, there is some very easy clues that a lot of the parts were actually shared. First thing, they put a nice rounded end cap on the dashboard. And although the dash itself is exactly the same as the predecessor, the design of the letters and numbers have changed. It just looks more updated. So again, the door cards, are pretty much the same with the exception of the door pocket. Now the windscreens in the Rover Metro are actually identical to the Austin Metro the only exception being is instead of having a stick-on patch to hold the mirror it's now got a proper glued on mirror boss but the actual windscreen itself is exactly the same. In fact all the glass on the Rover Metro is identical to its predecessor with the exception of the heated rear window. So in here, Ed has obviously got a replacement head unit. I think because this is a 1.1C, there was probably a blanking plate there, but I'm sure Ed will update me on that when I speak to him. So you have an ashtray. There would be a cigarette lighter there on a higher grade version. And because this K-series powered Metro has a carburetor, we have a manual choke. Even the interior light from the old metro as is the sun visors as is the keep fit window winders and even the door release handle let's start this rover up oh i miss that sound i love the sound of a rover k series engine in the morning So hiding behind the Rover 200 style seats, we jump in the rear. So sitting in the back with Ed's seat set in his driving position, not a lot of leg room. Although when the Metro was launched, it was known for its cabin space. But unfortunately, this is not helped by the larger Rover 200 seats. They're obviously very comfortable. They're very smart. For front seat passengers, they're absolutely excellent. Your rear seat passengers, maybe not so happy. And again, because it's a 1.1C, we've got A-frame headrests. And again, showing its age, we have an ashtray in the rear. Another difference between Ed's 1.1C and my previous 1.1S, the engines are absolutely identical. Super smooth, K-series, 8 valve 60 brake horsepower engine which at the time when it was launched was a million miles away from the gearbox in sump A plus engine that was fitted to the previous generation. One of the quirks of the gearbox in sump design was every Metro that I ever owned always used to lose a little bit of oil. You don't get that of course with the K series it uses a PSA Peugeot Citroen gearbox. It's a very slick gearbox, very smooth gearbox. But there's only four forward ratios on the 1.1C, whereas the 1.1S had five. So whilst I'm sitting in the back of Ed's car, this brings back lots of memories for me, folks. I had, now let me think how many metros I had. Four metros, three of them being Austin metros. Started with a City X which was just one step up from poverty spec. Then I had a five-door City X when the five-door was launched. Then I had an MG Metro, still with the A-plus engine, so still with the gearbox in sump, but it was a whole 1275 cc's of power. What it lacked in absolute performance, it certainly had a nice engine note with the exhaust. 
now we're going to have a look at that K-Series engine. So when the K-Series engine was launched, it was a million miles away from its predecessor, the A-plus engine. Extremely smooth. It's got a fast warm-up design to it, so it, it eats up to normal running temperature within minutes. On the later ones, this did prove to be problematic because they have suffered from head gasket problems, although there is now a fix for that. Do you know, folks, this is definitely like a trip down memory lane for me, and I'm genuinely grateful for Ed taking the time to travel all the way down to Derbyshire today. So obviously on the Rover Metro we have different headlights, big plastic bumpers. Now these big plastic bumpers are actually very key to one of the previous Metro's failings. On the previous Metro the bumpers were very small, they're very slim and the problem with that was is you had a big metal valance here and this valance because it was metal, used to catch every stone it could possibly catch. You'd always see them with lots of stone chips and ultimately those stone chips would always lead to rust. So again for the Rover Metro the front wings were different and they gained a wheel arch liner which prevented another failing of its predecessor where the arches would effectively cake up with mud and it would rot from the inside out. The doors are actually identical from the Austin Metro and the rear quarter panel is also identical with the exception of the fuel filler. The fuel filler on the earlier generation was actually located down here behind a flap and that was very low. You can imagine when you were filling up your car you'd have to have a good back because you'd have to remain bent over for the whole time you were filling the car. Not that it took that long to fill because it was only a 32 litre fuel tank. Unfortunately what Rover didn't address was the same rust problem on the rear arch. They still do attract mud and dirt and if you don't keep on top of that again they will rot from the inside out. So of course being the 1.1C we have a little plug there where the rear wiper would go and for a very limited time the 1.1c had this three piece bumper so you've got a metal bumper but then they put these end caps on to match the style of the front bumper the boot is of a very good size can't remember the liters for the boot so i'll put that in the description below now in 1995 rover rebranded the metro and brought the naming convention in line with the other products that they were producing so it was named the Rover 111 if it had the 1.1 engine and unsurprisingly it was named 114 if it had the 1.4 engine. They also launched a GTI version and they launched a GTI version which was initially released with a 95 brake horsepower single point fuel injected twin cam K-series engine later to be given multi-point fuel injection which took it from 95 brake horsepower to 103 brake horsepower. One issue the Metro had with the bigger wheeled versions was that no Metro has power steering. Rover released an automatic version of the K-Series engine which was linked to a CVT or constant variable transmission gearbox. I have driven a CVT Metro Anyone that's used to CVT gearboxes will know how they drive. They are very smooth, but the one thing you immediately notice when you pull away is the revs shoot up very quickly and then the car effectively catches up with it. I think the Rover Metro deserved its early sales success. It was a good solid car with now modern upgraded engines and gearboxes. Some nice Rover touches including the Rover 200 seats and the steering wheel. It was a very pleasant car to drive and very economical. So what eventually caused the demise of the Rover Metro? Well the biggest cause was in 1997 Euro NCAP released its crash test results and gave the Rover Metro one star. The rating was so poor it actually made it onto BBC News and shortly afterwards the sales for the Rover Metro or the Rover 100 series dried up. Now I will go on camera folks and say 
I love British Lyland products, I love Rover products, yes of course we love our Citroen 2CV and there are many Citroens that we love but I will always have a soft spot for Austin Rover products I've certainly owned enough of them So that's it folks, it's been an absolute pleasure to review Ed's Rover Metro 1.1C.